on somebody. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know y'all works. Y'all getting another one started. God is so good. We're excited to be in the presence of God. With, <laughs> all right now. With that being said, I want us to prepare to receive the man of God while we're standing, just to show honor, because the Lord has been equipping us in such a way that he doesn't have to, you see? But through his mercy, he has been revealing to us what's to come through the prophet that he's placed over this house. So let's just celebrate what the Lord is doing. Hallelujah. And let us just take a few seconds to build ourselves up in the Holy Ghost in, in behalf of Pastor Moses. Shikarama Shiketa. Father, we give you praise for this meeting that you have ordained, O oh God, even before time, to minister your gospel through this vessel tonight. Lord, grant unto us the ear to hear, a spirit of understanding, O oh God, that we may hear this word and run with it. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. We all said amen. And let us receive the man of God, Pastor Moses Anderson. God, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, let's be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God, let us all be seated. God is good. Uh, you can be seated too, and you can be reseated because you were already seated. God is good. Oh, what an awesome time of fellowship and celebration at the baby shower. Uh, that was good. That was some good, good spirit. And um, and I'm, I'm just so excited that we're able to genuinely translate sweet fellowship into doing life with one another. You know, so we're not just coming to say we're brothers and sisters in Christ and bash each other with a couple of scriptures, but then after that, we're strangers. You know, it's good to be able to celebrate one another. And if you're wondering who was baby showered, there she is, that's Diamond. She was, yeah, come on, praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. It's good to have our brother Eric and Cedric, our brothers Eric and Cedric with us again today. I appreciate you guys greatly. God bless you. God is good. So we're just going to get right into it. Um, I will, uh, well, let's get right into it. Uh, hallelujah. You see, the thing is, um, whenever there is confusion about anything in the world, it's because God is setting up the stage to announce you. You understand what I mean? So, um, you see, Alan read a scripture saying that the, the, he was talking specifically about Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. He then spoke to the elders. You know, because when you're filled with the Spirit, it allows for you uh, to tap into the unction for addressing um, long-standing habits and cultures and cultural norms. You know, when you're addressing the elders, you're talking to the people that have been upholding, you know, religious notions and concepts and strongholds. And so he takes being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe it was Paul who also elaborated on that subject when he said the, oh, the holy man of old spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. You see, when you think about the Holy Spirit inspiring in you and I the words to speak, then we begin to appreciate the situations that we get to face or the situations that we are faced with simply because God sets the stage first before introducing his spirit. Let's make it simple. Come with me to Genesis chapter 1. Because my desire today is that... Um, you will see yourself in the Word of God. Now, okay, let me, let, me, let me say that to Brother Stefan in the back. You will see yourself in the Word of God. You know, and in order for it not just to be 
received as a cliche, let me explain what that means. The Bible says, we beholding as in a mirror, the glory of God are being changed into that same image. So when you look, when you're standing in front of a mirror, you want to see yourself where? In that mirror. I mean, it's going to be weird if you stood in front of a mirror, but your image that you're seeing is on the wall or on the floor. That would not be a very clear image. You could have a reflection on the wall with light bouncing off. You could have a shadow of yourself on the ground with light being obstructed. But the true image that you want to behold needs to form inside of the mirror. And that is the reason why the Bible says when it comes to being transformed to become like Christ, who was the word of God that became flesh, you have to be able to see yourself in that mirror. We beholding as what? As in a mirror, the glory of God, we are being changed into that same image. It is very important for us to be able to see ourselves in the Word of God. To be able to see the many dimensions of our existence and God's manifestation of His glory, we need to be able to see all of those clearly. Because we have to be able to behold it to become it. Because if you don't see it, you cannot be it. Elisha wanted to be like Elijah. That was his life's mission. He saw what God was doing in the life of Elijah. And he knew that a nation that identifies as a nation of God or a people of God must always have a prophet of God. Because there must always be an oracle to deliver the mind of God. And that's why the apostles reminded us, even in the New Testament, that let everyone who speak, speak as an oracle of God. Because it is not everybody who opens their mouth that speaks. We need to correct that notion. Because some people open their mouths and make sounds, but they are not speaking. They may be echoing what someone else has said. They may be simply agreeing with what somebody else has said, but to speak means to originate words. So if Selah comes in here and tells us of an experience that she had, and I come after her and I repeat what she said, I am not speaking because I'm not originating those words. I'm only echoing that which has been said. Let me give you a very good example from the life of Jesus. Jesus gathered his 12 together and he asked them, he gathered his disciples together, the ones who eventually became apostles when they finally woke up. He asked them, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, well, some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're a teacher. Some even say that you are Elias that is to come, which is Elijah. But Jesus was like, okay, all righty. But who do you say that I am? And then Peter spoke and said, you are Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus says, well, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my father, which is in heaven. Why did Jesus say that? Jesus wanted it to be very clear that Peter was not just echoing what he heard from Andrew, which Andrew heard from John the Baptist. If you haven't heard me expound on that for your sake, I'm going to just quickly touch on it a little bit because when Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed to you, but my Father in heaven, anyone who is familiar with the ministry of John the Baptist will know that John the Baptist was flesh and blood, and he was the first person to tell Andrew and Peter that Jesus was the Lamb of God. But Jesus is now saying what you said, you did not receive it from flesh and blood. Now, a lot of Bible scholars and theologians get confused because they're like, but Jesus, Peter heard from Andrew and John about who you are. 
And so which one is it? Is Jesus right? Or the history that we have is right? Let me say this again very slowly because the reason why we need to go to Genesis, the book of beginnings, is because I want us to see ourselves in that mirror that is the word of God. Okay? I want us to see ourselves in that mirror. And if you're still wondering if the word of God is the mirror or the image in the mirror, I tell you that the word of God is both the mirror and the image in the mirror. The Bible says we'll be holding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, but also anyone who looks into the perfect law of liberty, which is the word of God, but does not continue therein, the Bible says it's like a man who beholds himself in a mirror and walks away forgetting what he looked like. You understand what I mean? Still the same word of God that is the mirror. Okay? I have to say that again because I could see question mark on the heads of some people who didn't quite get that. So that is my preamble, preamble, and now I am building a case around that preamble so that we can get to the focal point of the conversation. So Jesus, when he said to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. If you do not listen very closely and by the Holy Spirit to what Jesus was saying, you will be confused or you may be confused because we knew that Peter didn't just wake up one day and know about Jesus. He heard from somebody else. And I can prove that to you. When Jesus was about to be baptized by John, what did John say? John said, and the Bible records that Andrew and Peter were there. He said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That was what he said. What did Andrew say to Peter? Peter, I mean, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Andrew received that revelation and he turned to Peter and he says, You need to come because we have found the Christ. One talked about his sacrifice. The other one talked about his anointing because the word Christ means the anointed one or the Messiah. So John said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He was speaking from his own personal revelation because he came baptizing in the Jordan, preaching repentance because without having preached repentance, there is no acceptance of the sacrifice. So his focus was on the Lamb of God. When Andrew received it, Andrew received it, and he says, if this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, what does that mean to me? That means this is my Messiah, the one who has come to save me. So one of them talks about what he does. Another talks about how he does it. Those were the two things that Peter heard from flesh and blood. So when Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter knew that at that particular point in time, Jesus was not asking for what John said. Jesus was not asking for what Peter, for what Andrew said. Jesus was asking for what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the chosen ones. And that was the reason why Peter did not say you're a lamb. He didn't say you're the Messiah. He says you are Christ, son of the living God. He says because I'm not just here to talk about what you will do or how you will do it. I'm talking about what I will become when you are done. Because everything that the Lord does and says culminates in who you become by it. Because the whole premise of this particular installation that is called the earth and this experience that is called the human life, it, it is all about you becoming like the glory that you are beholding. And so we need to learn how to begin to see ourselves in the Word of God because what you see in that Word of God is what activates who you truly are from the inside so that you can become fruit-bearing, evidence-showing on the outside. And that is the reason why it is important for you to know exactly what you're looking at. When you're looking at crisis, when you're looking at darkness, when you're looking at chaos, what exactly are you to see and where are you in that picture? Because the world that we live in right now is in abject darkness. The Bible says in the last days darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness indeed the people. 
And that is the reason why people no longer know who they are or who they should be. Because of the darkness. Have you tried to look at your own image in a mirror at night where there is no light? You could become a gremlin and you wouldn't know. You could stop being who you are. You could turn into an ogre and not even know. Simply because you need light to be able to behold what is in front of you. And so if people stop knowing who they are or who a woman is or who a man is or who they are, who, where, where their allegiance belongs. In fact, do you know that even nations now have lost their identity? Because a nation that is convinced to easily give up its sovereignty is the nation that has lost its identity. Sovereignty is essentially what? How do you define the sovereignty of a nation? The sovereignty of a nation is defined by the collective will of a people to defend who they are, their identity. The moment we no longer have an identity, what we are defending becomes zero, and effort multiplied by zero is always zero. And so that is what is going on in the world, and it is masterminded by the serpent. That was the outcome of the power that was given to the serpent with which to deceive the nations. Power was given to the serpent and finally he was able to complete his plan. And that plan was to take people's identity away by taking their light away because the moment you are not able to see what you're looking at, it is easy for me to turn you into something else and you will agree with me. So it is more important now in fact, I would borrow a word that a friend of mine likes to use. It has become of utmost significance and it has become imperative for us to know who we are. But we cannot know who we are unless God reveals to us. <laughs> you see, because he... Being the engineer and the architect knows exactly what he made. You understand what I mean? So you can't make up what you think you are. You know, we've been through church and through all kinds of movements wherein we try to teach people how to understand their purpose without teaching them how to hear the voice of the maker. So how can I understand my purpose when in fact whatever my purpose is would have to be what he had in mind when he made me unless I agree with Darwin that I just accidentally emerged. I am too fearfully and too wonderfully made to have been the product of an accident. I am too scientific also to believe that this being that you're looking at could have resulted out of chaos. Sometimes I emerge out of chaos, but I'm not the result of the chaos. You see, because in science, we know that there is a law that is called the law of entropy. And what it means is that every particle that exists structurally in relation to another particle can only go from a state of orderliness to increase this orderliness. So that means if I have water in a cup, the molecules of water relate to one another and they stay within the boundaries defined by the cup. That is their beginning. If I spill the water, the future of that water, just seconds after I spill it or microseconds, becomes less orderly than what it started with. And if I left the water spilled on the floor and come back after 10 minutes, some of the water would have actually evaporated and become water vapor that is traveling even faster and further away from the other molecules. And so it starts from a state of orderliness to increased disorderliness. Every molecule or every matter or energy that you subject that law to conforms. So how can then you say that we started from a big bang, which was big chaos, and then became orderly to the point wherein the ocean knows its boundaries? 
The same so-called scientists, they teach you the law of entropy when you're going into the lab because they don't want you to burn the building. So they tell you the truth about things truly work. But the moment they get you out of that lab back into the classroom, they tell you the opposite of it, that we can have order out of chaos. And God did that in his goodness so that you and I can, should not be so easily deceived. Because the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. And so if there is a witness in the lab and that witness does not come to the classroom, something is wrong. So I say all of that to say that it is important for us to know that we were made by God for a reason with a purpose in mind. And there is a way God operates when it comes to his children. And that way is simply defined as this. God relates with us as though we are himself. Because we are in him. If, if I have a way of, of putting a person inside of me, there's no way I'm going to take a gun and shoot that person. Because whatever it is that I target toward that person has to go through me. And the Bible says that it is in him that we live and move and have our being. So God is not going to feed you poison because you are inside of him. That's why the Bible says that God is not evil and he will not tempt any one of us with evil because he is a good God and there's no evil in him. And because I am in him, no evil can come to me. But that is if I am in him. We are in him, but we can always project ourselves to be outside of him. The you that is in him is your born again spirit. Your spirit that is the regenerated spirit. The moment you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are born again, that instance of you that is in your heavenly father becomes activated. It comes to life. But some of us choose to live outside of him. We choose to live in the flesh. And that is the reason why all kinds of nonsense happens to us. I believe... Okay, one more scripture and then we're going to be ready. You see, I just saw that scripture around there, which is an interesting scripture. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 3, it says that Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. And I'm just going to borrow that because I was thinking of how to complete the foundation so we can finally read this Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. When the Bible says Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining, why would they do that? They will only do that if they identify a need for light. You see, when people are still enjoying the blackness of the darkness, they will not seek light. But the moment they begin to stumble and everything starts to crumble, then they would look for the light. So now let us read Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In the beginning, God introduced his Spirit after revealing the darkness, the emptiness, and the formlessness. <laughs> you see, why did God make us? And why did he make us and put us here? The answer is because there was a problem that he was trying to solve. He created the heavens and the earth, but he couldn't rest because the work was not done. The Bible says that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Let me first of all talk about the fact that the Holy Spirit was then introduced after that. The reason why there is so much darkness in our world today, the reason why we have the moral corruption and decadence is because God is setting up the stage to introduce his children. Hmm. 
If I brought a candlestick and I hold it against this halogen lamp, you would say to me, can you put out your candle? Your lame candle? Because ain't nobody need that candle in here. But then someone can go to the back and cut out the electricity. And all the floodlights go off and suddenly everybody is looking for the man with the candle. As long as there is a form of light, the world will not come seeking you. And we know there is a form of light in the world, which is not the true light. The Bible says Satan will come as an angel of light. And so will his messengers. And so there is some kind of light that exists in the world. It is mostly called information. And so because we are loaded with so much information today, many people feel like they do not need to seek another light because when they have a headache, they go one line. When they need to find out exactly how to treat their spouse at home, they find a blog. When people want to know exactly how to raise children, they order a book from Amazon because there are other kinds of lights out there. But those other lights are made up of six colors and not seven. Because there is only one light that is the true light. And that is the light of God that is made of those seven component spirits. And that is the true spectrum of benevolence. And it is not what the world is looking for yet. Because they have the six colored light that makes them proud. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that light is ordinary knowledge. And what does that knowledge do? The Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And so when people have that knowledge that it removes God out of the equation, then you're no longer operating at number seven, which is the number of God. You're operating at number six, which is the number of men. And that is the reason why the pride flag had the six colors. So correct all of those people online every chance you get if you're so led Whenever they say, oh yeah, because I've seen people, in fact, I've seen people at conferences, big shows, telling people, oh, they, these people are using the rainbow, which is God's sign of, of promise. I'm like, that rainbow is not a rainbow. Whatever that thing is, is not, rainbow is seven colors. We don't even need to be reminded. We just need to look up every time it rains and you will see it. And if you can't wait for the rain, look for a shiny car under the sun and start spraying water on it. You will see the spectrum of light. Because rainbow is essentially a reflection of light through water. So every time you can reflect, reflect light through water, it's really refraction, but we call it reflection, but it's okay. It will give you the seven colors, right? And God warned us not to follow what someone puts in front of you on paper, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that it is from the visible elements of creation that we understand the invisible attributes of God and of the eternal powers. So when I look at creation, I see seven colors and that's what makes the rainbow of God. How did anybody, or why did we even ever let anyone sell us on the idea of six colors and call it the rainbow? It's not a rainbow. It has one more color before it can become the rainbow. And the moment you introduce that one color, you come under the authority of God. And that is the reason why rebellion is the number six. And if you're still in doubt, look at the number of the beast. The Bible says the number of the beast will be 666 because six is the number of man. It's there in Revelations. It's the number of the man. And who is the man? They're talking about the man who chooses to replace God with himself. And so we know from what we see that light is appreciable when there is darkness, absolute darkness. But until that darkness is made complete, which heaven's yardstick for measuring when darkness becomes complete is very simple. Is that you can no longer tell the form of things. You can no longer tell 
where the boundaries are. Oh, you all aren't following me just yet. The Bible says do not remove the ancient boundaries. But you need light to see boundaries. In abject darkness, you cannot see boundaries. And what is going on in the world today is that we are slowly seeing, not even slowly, very quickly, sporadically, seeing boundaries get eroded. You remember a while ago or sometime long, long ago, wherein children have to obtain permission from their parents to do things that could change them forever. We used to ask for permission from our parents to actually have candy because it can change your teeth forever. But now that boundary has now been eroded or is being eroded in some places wherein a child could choose to cut off his arm just because he believes he's become a tripod. So he doesn't need two, hand, two, two hands and two legs anymore. He just wants only three. You understand what I mean? And they say that it is okay. Why? Because the boundaries have been eroded. Now, the more eroded the boundaries are, the closer we are to the completion of darkness. Now, let me say this. Darkness has to be made complete before Jesus comes. Because as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. This was where we started from. We started from total darkness where there was no form and it was void. To be void means to contain nothing. So, the Holy Spirit was introduced after the darkness, the emptiness, and the formlessness or the chaos was seen. Because without those things preceding the introduction of the glory of God, people may choose to settle for everything else but that glory. Remember my little candle that people despised? now became what Gentiles are running to and kings are coming to. And you know why? Simply because now people have developed an appreciation for it because they have seen darkness firsthand. So let's keep that at the back of our minds because we need to understand that and then weaponize it so that we can become as dangerous as we need to be to the kingdom of darkness. Remember, we're taking the battle to the gates of our enemy. And the strategy that we want to implement is such that they would flee before we get to the gate. Uh, let, me, let me explain that very quickly because every one of us here were faced with opposition after opposition because Jesus made us a promise. He says, in the world, you will have tribulations, but in me, you have peace. So basically, every time you go out in the world, tribulations and trials are awaiting, but it's for a purpose, but in me, you have peace so you can handle the situations, whatever they are, right? Jesus made us that promise. So what we need to do is we need to learn how to apply that peace for victory and how to apply ourselves for that peace. So I'm going to explain that in two ways very quickly. Way number one is this. Knowing that we're at war allows for us to begin to examine weapons, because it's like, if you're not at war, then who cares? You just need a pencil to write love letters but, and a fork to eat. But when you're at war, you need something that can deal a blow on the enemy. So what have I just said? I have just said that the significance of understanding the strategy for war begins with the awareness that there is actually a war. But then the kind of war that you're fighting will determine the kind of weapons that you select and the strategy that you apply. When David was to fight Goliath, Saul brought his armor and offered it to, jo to, to David. And David looked at it, and David was like, um, I can't fight Beelzebub with Beelzebub. The man out there is decked in armor. And his armor is several times the size of yours. So what is the difference, or what's the assurance that this can even dent his shield. So we need to go higher. We need something that can go higher. And of course, you know that a stone and a sling goes higher than a shield that is made of steel. It's a no-brainer. You know that now because you read it, but back in the day, they didn't know that because they were living the reality of it so that we can learn from them. 
They should have just already known that there was no way the armor of Saul stands against Goliath. But because David knew that that battle was not a battle of spears and swords because God had been brought into the battle and God does not use such weapons. Don't worry, it's all going to come together. Just let your, your spirit-filled mind follow along. David heard when Goliath was saying that he was going to deal a blow on the people of God. And that's all David needed to hear because David knew that his, God's people are the apple of his eyes. And so there's no way someone would say to me they want to poke my eye and I would not respond to defend myself because that eye is a part of me. And so because we're a part of God, it rises to our defense. And so David was like, Goliath is not coming after man. He has gone after God, and God does not use these things. So we need to go and apply what God uses. Apply that principle to your situation and my situation. Who are we? The believers, what are we? We are Cyrus. Cyrus means the possessors of the furnace. The furnace means hell. We are the ones that will possess the gates of our enemies. And what did Jesus describe the gates of our enemies as? He says the gates of hell. And they will not prevail against you. Why will they not prevail against you? He updated John at the end of his ministry. Maybe not the end of his ministry. The end of his exposition. Because nobody really knew the end of John's ministry. Okay? So at the end of his exposition that we call the apocalypse, revelations, John said, aha, now I know. We overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony. What did Paul say? Paul says that we are more than conquerors. Now, this is where we need to, I would like for us to pay attention because a lot of us need to simplify our lives. We're living our lives harder than God intended it. We're trying to apply too much of our own effort. And what it's doing is it's just getting us to sink deeper and deeper into the merry clay rather than standing still and let him lift us up. So what does it mean? And I have shared this with you before. I think majority of the people in this room have heard me say that what it means to be more than a conqueror is to look at a conqueror and look at what it means. A conqueror is somebody who conquers in battle. So if I go to battle and I win, I'm a conqueror. But I need to always be at alert because the people that I've conquered will one day rise up to overturn the table because life goes in a ring. What goes around comes around. So it's just a question of time. Every conqueror gets challenged. This is not even philosophy. It's just pure math and science, the truth. Right? And so if I'm a conqueror, if I conquer this chair, because I defeated other people, like if you're doing like the musical chairs, I need to do it again. You understand what I mean? I need to keep doing it because I acquired it by fighting for it. So that is a conqueror. So the one that is more than a conqueror is one that manages to obtain victory without fighting. So if there's a way of receiving victory, whatever way by which you receive victory is the way by which you maintain victory. So if you obtain victory by fighting, you would have to maintain that crown by fighting. And that is the reason why they say uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. But what if it is a crown of glory that was given to you because of something that never changes? The Bible says we're more than a conqueror. Why? Because he loves us. So the love of God, which is eternal, is the reason why we're more than conquerors. Now, I know that there's a lot of explaining and doing here, but I pray that you see the significance of what I am saying and what I am teaching so that you can apply it in your daily lives because when I said that the way you want the battle to go is for the enemy to flee before you get there, I, I knew that not many people were tracking with me. But we started this about three weeks ago when I read to you when God was saying, don't worry what happens to you, even the lame I will cause to overcome. You understand what I mean? Because God is not expecting you 
to fight. He just wants you to approach. Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail. So basically what's going to happen is the moment you have the confidence enough in God to approach, they will flee before you. What? See. <laughs> it's an identity problem. The moment you understand that you are in him and he is in you, then what happens when you get up? That means he gets up. And the Bible says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. That is the way we need to view the battle that we are in. The gates of hell shall not prevail because by the time we get to the furnace, they are all gone. That is the way you live your life on the daily. Stop trying to headbutt the enemy. Because if you play by their rules, you are bound to lose because they are not fair gamers. They are deceivers. They are cheaters. They will change it around you every now and again just to put you to shame. So what do you do? You fight by the rules of the great commander himself. And he says, don't go until I'm with you. Don't get ahead of me. I'm doing something. When I'm ready, we'll move together and we have victory. So, let us come back to this concept of the reason why there is darkness in the world. There is darkness in the world because that is what you were made for. And the Lord wants to introduce us to the scene like he introduced his Holy Spirit. You and I have come to such a time as this because the one who made you, made you for a purpose. And that purpose is to fix a problem. And that is the reason why you are composed the way you are composed. So let's read the problem again. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. What are the problems? There was darkness. And the Bible says the earth was without form. So God was like, okay, let's tackle the issue of formlessness. The earth is without form. So what did he do? Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. The Bible says, and the Lord God Almighty said, let us now make man in our own image, after our own likeness. And the Bible goes on to say, and from the dust of the earth, the Lord God formed man. Why did he form you to fix formlessness? The Bible says that the earth, the earth was without form and void. How did he fix the void situation? He says, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the surface of the whole earth. How did he fix the, what's the third problem? The earth was without form and void. And what? And darkness was upon the face of the deep. How does he fix darkness? By making you light. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So everything that he made you to be, he made you to be in response to a situation that he was faced with. And so, you and I, if we grasp that revelation that we exist to solve problems that God identified, then what should be our attitude to problems? It should be that of joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment. Because I came into the picture for this purpose. Jesus said concerning himself, 
when he saw that Satan was, fall, was falling like lightning. That to many of us is like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Satan is falling as lightning. But Satan falling to the earth is not victory, it's chaos. The Bible says there was war in the heavens. Satan took a third of the angels and they rebelled against God and Michael cast Satan down to the earth. They cast him down like lightning because when they kicked him out of heaven, he was still a light bearer. So he came as a ball of light striking through the firmament to hit the crust of the earth. And we think that is victory. No, that is problem because the angel says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth because the Falling one, because the deceiver has now fallen. I'm going to give you, okay, let me, let me show you a little picture of what's coming. Because I know it's going to help you appreciate what I am breaking down to you. Come with me to Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 7 or 27. The book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is before the book of Job. Actually, before the book of Esther. Nehemiah, Esther, and then Job. So it's somewhere there if you're looking for it. Now, look at what it says in verse 7. It says, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant David. He says, we haven't done it. So what are ordinances, what are statutes, and what are commandments? Remember, God is light. Okay? And he exists in heaven. The Bible says heaven is his throne and the earth his footstool. And so for that light that God is to illuminate our lives... Channels have to be created to pierce through the veil that is called time. Time is a veil that keeps us separate from eternity. And so God introduces commandments and statutes as light rods that operate by the principles of capillarity or capillarity, however you want to say it, to bring us light. So light channels come through to the earth. When you obey God, and you are in compliance with his word, guess what happens? Your heart is illuminated. The Bible says that the, earth, the word of God is living and powerful and is able to penetrate the dividing membrane to discern. The word discern there essentially means to illuminate the thoughts and the intents of your heart. So without God's word and his commandments and his statutes, there is no light. So when God commands us to do a thing, it's not because he wants to make your life difficult. It's because he wants to help you make it easy by bringing in light into a dark world. You understand what I mean? By bringing light into a dark world. Do you know how dark it is when you are at loggerheads with someone? You and somebody are not friends. You're keeping malice. You're angry with one another. Do you know that suddenly a person who claims to be the lover of your soul, they want to love you forever. When y'all have a misunderstanding, then you appear to one another as though you are each other's enemies. Let's, let's bring it home a little further. Let's take a spouse. I mean, let's take a couple, for example. A man and his wife. They love each other to bits. And then they get into an argument. And they start to call each other names. Some of them who are not very civilized actually attempt to be physical and start to throw punches at one another and, and throw pans and all of So who do we throw weapons are at? Not our friends, our enemies. Who do we yell to? People who are far from us. So... Someone who is in love with you, who's supposed to be sharing your heart space with you, you now get into a situation wherein you are yelling at them as though they are two streets away. And that's because when there is a misunderstanding, you become far from each other. Right? When there's misunderstanding, you no longer see each other as who you truly are. You don't, you don't see each other as lovers and as friends anymore because there's now a chasm between both of you and 
when there is darkness, what did the Bible say happens? The Bible says when there is darkness, there is formlessness. So the beautiful wife that you were just telling all the sweet nothings two hours ago now becomes a person you're calling a beast and all kinds of names simply because her form has been taken away. Let me, let me explain that again. You see, if the husband and the wife can see each other for who they truly are, lovers of each other's soul, beautiful in each other's eyes, then they will not call each other names that are untrue. I'm teaching you spiritual warfare. And it's going to make more sense as we go along. You are the solution to darkness. Because everywhere there is darkness, there is chaos, there is lack of form or deformity, and there is also emptiness. Can I prove that to you? Michelle, if you get into an argument with somebody that you're friends with, let's even say a child of yours that you love so dearly, and then you get into an argument, guess what happens? The darkness creates deformity, so you're no longer the loving mother. Then they begin to pick at you and talk about all the ugliness of your life, even though you're not ugly, but because deformity is what we call ugliness. Imagine if you found somebody whose nose is on their head. They can't really be beautiful, can they? Because they are deformed. Following deformity is what? Void, emptiness. There was darkness, there was deformity, and there was what? Emptiness. What is emptiness? You see, all the kindness that you have shown to them, all the gifts that you have given to them, the sacrifices you have made to them, suddenly become sucked into the blackness of the darkness. And they suddenly forget all your virtues. And that is why people that you have been nice to, kind to, they, keep, they challenge you like, what have you even ever done for me? And they're not lying at that particular point in time. They're telling you what they're experiencing and what they're feeling because darkness has managed to come in to deform who you are to them. So you're no longer the lover of their soul. You're not their enemy. You're no longer the one who has, who has bled over them in sacrifices because all those sacrifices are now gone because the black hole of the darkness has sucked them in. And so when you look at you and I, that is our very mission in life, and it is to combat darkness, to combat, rather, darkness anywhere that it shows its ugly face. And the beauty of our assignment is that it is the easiest assignment in the world. Can I tell you how it's the easiest assignment in the world? Because you just have to Show up. Huh. When God made man, man was not involved. And yet, it was the solution to the problem. God was the one that formed man from the earth because the earth had been without form. So he formed man to correct the deformity. He was the one who breathed his life into man so that that which was empty can now be full of eternal life. He was the one who gave man the power to be fruitful and to multiply so that he can replenish the surface of the whole earth. Please excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, what exactly can man take credit for in all of what God did to solve the problem of darkness? In John chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible says that in Jesus, the word that became flesh, in him was life and that, in fact, the Holy Spirit said to me to read everything to you. John chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. Not Shelah, but the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That means the Word holds the final say, because that's what it means to be God. To be God means to be unquestionable, to have the final authority. And the Bible says, by him all things were made, and there was nothing made that was made without the Word. So you and I cannot really make anything except that which the word has made. I say this because I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, you will retire from your position of being God in your own life and elevate from the six colors 
to the seven so that there can be perfection in your life. Because we need God to fight this battle. And when I say we need God to fight this battle, what I mean is exactly that we need God to be the one to fight the battle. I'm an, I'm, I don't need God so that I can fight the battle. I need God to fight the battle. You understand what I mean? So I have to understand that by him all things were made and there was nothing made that was made without him. And the Bible says in verse 4 that in him was life and that life was the light of man. The actual meaning of that word is that in him was life and that life was the light that is man. That life in the instance of the human being becomes light. And the Bible says the light shines forth in darkness and the darkness cannot comprehend it. I will read to you one more scripture. The same chapter 1 of John. By the time you get to verse 12, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, for as many as have received him, even to them that believe on his name, have we given the power to become the sons of God. The power to become what? The sons of God. The word sons of God means the solutions to the problem. Because the Bible says that the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now let me quickly put everything together for you in summary. Folks, we are at war with the darkness. And the closer we are to claiming the victory, the darker it needs to get because we're approaching the origin of the darkness. You see, how did we get here? We often ask ourselves. How did we get to this place wherein children are now disobedient to parents? How did we get to this place wherein people have become lovers of themselves, not lovers of God? How did we get to this place? We ask all of these questions. We didn't get here accidentally. We got here because this was where we were coming from. It's a circle and we're back to the point wherein we started. We have come to a place of so much darkness in the world because the earth itself began its journey shrouded in darkness. So it is not my fault. It is not your fault. But the only one that is your part to play is what we read in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 7 that says the darkness that is in the world is natural. It is always there. The one that God is concerned about is the darkness that is in you because you shut out the commandments and the statutes of God. So all I need to pay attention to is the word of God and what is he saying to me because the moment I can hear what he is saying to me, I have all the equipping I need to rise. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light is come. That is all. Once my light comes, what do I do? I just rise. I don't have to make an effort because light does not need to make an effort to drive away darkness. It just needs to rise. I need to rise to the darkness in my marriage. I need to rise to the darkness in my business. I need to rise to every darkness that shows up anywhere near me on this earth that God has given to me to be in dominion over. And how do I do that? I make sure that I shine the light on what God has already put inside of the other person that the glory of Christ may be revealed. It is not my business to call out the darkness. The darkness can do its own job. It is not my place to keep calling out what is wrong with the world and what is wrong with people, it is my place to see what is wrong with the world, to get a good sense of my direction and purpose and then rise to the occasion and let, rise, rise to the occasion and let the one who does battle take care of the rest. Why am I saying this to you? Three reasons, predominantly. Many believers are tired already. And if you show a tired man anything that looks like more work, they just give up. I have come here today to warn the body against the great apostasy. Because the Bible says before the great day of the coming of the Lord, there will be a great falling away. And the falling away will be by the man 
and women who can no longer carry on because we are tired already. And then if you show us any more work that we need to do, like a battle that we need to, that we need to fight, we will just completely throw in the towel. And so I am here today to let you know that when you see that battle, don't be afraid it is not yours to fight. Because if you don't know this thing in your Noah, if you do not know it in your heart, you know when they say you know it in your Noah, Noah means rest. You need to know it in, from a place of rest. Because if you don't know it and be rest assured that the Lord will fight the battle, that the enemies will flee before you get there, you will be discouraged, you will be disappointed, and you will, at the end of the day, give up rather than stand up. I took my time today by the grace of God to explain these things to us because we need to recognize that the battle, the battle is the Lord's. And he just wants you to rise because all he made you for was to be a carrier of that light. And he says, I just want you to keep paying attention to my word. Because when you look into that mirror, when you look into that word, you then stand a chance of becoming that word. And the moment you become that word, that word is light. Then you become radiant. And when you become radiant, what does the Bible say about a radiant object? The Bible says that the light shines forth in darkness. And the darkness cannot comprehend it. The darkness cannot prevail against it. The light does not have to exchange blows with the darkness. It just needs to show up and the darkness on its own will take up and leave. We are not going to the gates of hell to throw punches because we are already more than conquerors. We are the guys who have victory not because we fought. We are the ones who have victory because we are loved. And because I am loved, I am light. And because I am light, I stand and darkness flees. Because the devil wants to engage you in the fist fight because we are babes. The devil is of the order of the ancient ones, himself and his goons. They've been around for a long time. So when God made man, they showed up in heaven and they were bothered by it. God gave David an insight into that revelation. I believe it's in Psalms chapter 8, wherein David saw the ancient ones that came before the Lord of all spirits and they said to him, what is man that you are mindful of him? You don't even visit us, but you will visit him. They said, oh, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you will visit him. And I have come here to tell you today what man is. Because that is a question that even the ancient cannot answer. But the Bible says, I have an unction from the Holy One and I know all things. God has given you the unction by his Holy Spirit to know what you are. Because you are a mystery to the kingdom of darkness. They wonder what you truly are. Here is what I am. I am light. I am life. I am truth. Because Jesus says, as I am, so are you. Because I am everything in Christ and Christ is everything through me. But the devil does not want you to, and I to have that understanding because if we don't have that true understanding, then we will show up before Goliath holding a spear and a sword. And Goliath has a mightier sword than you because when he made us, he made us in his image and in his likeness. He didn't make us giants because we don't have to be. I don't have to be 20 feet tall. I wield the power of infinity. So what is size when I have power? <laughs> but, but there are certain beings that were made big because of their function. There are angels that are 80 feet tall. There are some of them that are one mile high because of their various functions. But I don't need that stature. The stature of my heavenly father is enough for me because it has all the potency in the world. And so when you are fighting the devil, you are fighting those who are mightier than you in the natural. And that's why you don't come against them in the natural. Look at Jacob, I mean Joshua and Caleb. When they went to Jericho, the other spies, they had their eyes open and they were like, these guys are giants. We are like grasshoppers in their side. But Joshua was like, it doesn't even mean anything because we are able. It is not by my stature, I am able. I don't have to have a giant credit score to possess what my heavenly father has already freely given to me. I don't have to have all the money in the world to be able to possess the land because my heavenly father commanded me to come. He said in Isaiah, come and buy you who have no money. 
And so we have been conditioned by Satan to think that we have to be like the giants to take the land, but it doesn't matter because we are able. In order for you to fight like God wants you to fight, which is not to throw punches but to rise, you need to see yourself in that light. When the walls of Jericho came down, did they throw punches? Did they fight? They just did all of what they could to get God to stand up. They were playing music and they were making noises. And every time my kids make noise, I want to go and find out what it is. And so when they were making noises, God was like, oh, I need to go find out what, Jake, what Joshua is about today. And the moment he got up, all of the enemies scattered. Even the wall bowed before the Lord. Of all. You see, the thing is, God wants you to enjoy life. And Jesus said, my burden is light, my yoke is easy. So if it's difficult, it's because you have not accepted the ease that he brings. Kayla, just think for a moment how difficult it is to prepare to fight a giant that is about five times your height. Where do you even begin to train? What, how do you even stand to look at that giant in the, in the eye? The giant gave an assessment of the situation in the natural. The giant was like, are you guys kidding me? That was what Goliath said. Goliath said, are you kidding me? You bring a dog to a man's fight? He said, who is this little scrungy dog that you have brought? And David was like, that is part of the strategy. You don't see me coming. Because the one that will put you in your place is an invisible God. And I'm his avatar. And so what I am telling us today, folks, is we need to understand what we are. We are the answer. Because when God saw the darkness, he made you light. When he saw deformity, he formed you according to the image of Christ. When he saw emptiness, he empowered you to be fruitful and to multiply. And all you have to do to attain all of those things is to rise up from the dust and look around and say, I am here. You see, let me tell you something. The word I am. <laughs> I am because he is. You see, the very first thing in the New Testament that we were told that the new creation in Christ Jesus is about is the power to become, not the power to perform. Performing miracles is a byproduct of becoming. Many of us worry too much about performing before becoming. And that is the reason why we, we don't measure up. Because we're competing against ancient forces who know how to do it better than us. And they keep taking us for a ride. So I'm not worried about those strategies anymore. All I care about is how do I become like the man in the mirror? Because Jesus is the man in that mirror. And I'm beholding the glory of God. And all I have to do is keep looking and then I will become transfigured. And the moment I get transfigured, the demons of hell don't want to find out whether it is Jesus or me. Because the last time he was there, he was ugly for them very quickly. Within three days, he took care of all of them. And so the moment you show up and you look like Jesus, from a distance, they announce to one another, guys, he's back. And they take off. I'm going to read to you one more verse of scripture. We're going to break bread. But before then, I want to say this to you. Before you watch this again, it's going to be broadcast tomorrow. Tomorrow is Sunday, right? We're going to have it on Facebook and on YouTube tomorrow. I want to encourage you to listen to it and break down the very many parts. There was a part that I stopped talking about, Elisha. You need to go complete that on your own on, with the help of the Holy Spirit because it's very important for us to know the power of seeing who we are to become, you know, from the Word of God. And there was also a time that I was talking about strategy for warfare, and I cut it short so that I can get back to the concept of what you are. Because that is my number one assignment today by the Holy Spirit to get to the concept of what you are. When it comes out tomorrow, I want you to watch it, listen to it, get scriptures, get understanding. But before then, there is one thing that I believe we must all do. Before then, I want you to start to think of yourself 
from the standpoint of who you are and not what you do. It is very important because what you do at best can only scratch the surface. If you think you drive out darkness, darkness is eternal. It has no end. When are you going to finish? But when you think of yourself as what you are, which is light, then you don't have to fight darkness. You just have to be light and darkness will always respect you and let you be. You understand what I mean? When you think about yourself as what Jesus said, Jesus says, I am the way. The, do you know that I am just beginning to see more and more that whenever God speaks to us, he speaks to us not based on what we can do, but based on who we are. What did God say you are, Manuel Lida? Did God ever say to you that you are righteous? No. If God says to you that you are righteous, then he is setting up a standard for you to maintain. Because if God says I'm righteous, oh, then I have to maintain that, that position because he says I'm righteous. So because he doesn't want to create work for you, right? That does not bring any result. So what did he say that you are? He says, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, whether I am sleeping, I am the righteousness. Whether I'm awake, I'm the righteousness. You can cut me, I bleed righteousness, because that is what I am. And so in all things and at all times, I am, I am, and I will be always who he says I am. The implication of that, when you begin to think like that, is it will break you free from efforts and it will put you in a place wherein you just shine. When he says of himself that I am the way, I am the truth. Michelle, if Jesus is the truth, you are the truth. And what does that mean? It means you are what the word of God says you are. And so I'm not trying to climb to the top because the word of God says I'm already above always and not beneath. And the significance of that, yet again, is that I am not doing it by my effort. I know that the requirements have been met. I just need to now live it out. The difference between doing it as an effort is you keep postponing the day that you become. You keep saying, oh, the moment I'm able to do this, then maybe that will happen, then I can become. No, I have already become life. So if anything about my life is showing lifelessness. Like the other day, I felt like my thumb was getting numb. And I'm like, it feels like something is not as alive as it needs to be. And so rather than looking for what to do to make it come to life, I just had to remind myself that I am life. And if my entire being is life, then no deadness can stay in the life because darkness cannot be in the light. So I'm not walking my way up to being life. I am operating with a top-down approach by first of all recognizing that I am life and I breathe that life down to everything in my world. My business, my family, my relationship with people. There are relationships that have died in your life. Not because God caused for them to die, but because you didn't nurture them. And they in turn are supposed to nurture you and now they have died. Okay, it's fine. Because your works have failed, but you have a backup which is your being. And so if I am the resurrection and the life, then dead relationships that are intended by God to benefit me should start to come to life. Because Jesus says, if any man be in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so if I am in him and he is in me, whatever I am in, Christ is in also. So if I am in that business, it cannot die. If I am in that neighborhood, the property values cannot collapse, even if Joe Blow sells his house for cheap. Because these are the things that keep us up at night. 
you're driving home and you notice that four or five of your neighbors are not cutting their grass and you can just see the graph on Zillow how your property value is coming down. And then the other day, some drunken man ran into the gate of your subdivision. And when they fixed it, they hired the, the, the chairman of the HOA. They hired his son to come and fix it. And rather than using stones, he used some kind of facade that is made out of chicken nest. You know that mesh for keeping chickens out? It happened somewhere in Swanee. And they just put a little bit of plaster on it. And every time you see things like that, you're like, oh my, that's my property value going down. You see... The value of what is yours is not determined by those things. Because God did not say that you will carry yourself with candor. He says, no, you are what royalty means. That's what he says. He says you are a royal priesthood. You are royalty itself. What it means to be royal, that is who you are. And so if I am royalty itself then that means I have the authority to set value on things. Do you not know that kings are the ones who determine how much tax you pay? How much taxes you pay? They set the value of what the exchange rate is. So one king in China will say, well, this is how much I want my money to be against the dollar. And the king of the dollar will say, okay, that's fine. Let's run that for 48 hours. Let's see how it goes. It is not always determined by what we think because buying and selling goes, up every, goes on every day. We consume about the same number of uh, bread slices that we consume. So how come there is differences in the exchange rate? Because the king set value. And so when you know who you are and what you are and you start to operate from that perspective, guess what? You won't have to exchange blows with Satan. You won't have to argue with situations. You won't have to try to convince anybody. You show up and the powers that be, they see you for who you are. But they know you don't know who you are if you don't know who you are. They can tell. Remember the apostles or the, the, the missionaries who wanted to copy the apostles. They saw the apostles were casting out demons. And they too, the seven sons of Sceva, and so they also were like, this is what they say. They say, in the name of Jesus, come out of him. So they practiced that in their closet a couple of times. And all seven of them came out like a band of demons. And they wanted to cast out demons. And you know what the demon said? The demon looked at them and said, Jesus, we know. Paul, we know. But who are you? He beat them black and blue. Because they did not really know who they are. And so could my problem all this while have been not Satan, not my ancestors, not the government? Could my problem all this while have just been that I myself don't know who I am in Christ Jesus? And the answer is 104% yes. Every single one of our problems, according to God, is a lack of knowledge of who we are. He says my people perish for lack of knowledge. If only they know who they are, they're not going to be arguing. So that one more scripture that we're going to read is from the book of Matthew. We're going to read Matthew. The other day we read Matthew 11, 27. Today, we're just going to read. No, we read Matthew 11, 7 the last time, right? Whichever one we read, we're reading the other one. So let's look at Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Yeah, so we read Matthew eleven seven, 7, and now we're going to read Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. And I want us to break bread. Now, let me say, let me encourage you. This verse of scripture, I believe there is just one word that you need to grab from it. And let that word become flesh to you. So when we read it, Read it with an open mind to find that word. Because as I was coming here today, the Lord said to me, one word. And I know that for many of us, that one word of revelation is all it takes for us to shake off the ignorance of our identity. So let's go. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. The Bible says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. All things have been given to who? The Son. And no one knows the Son except the Father. What did I tell you earlier on? I said to us earlier on, and this is where we zone in on the breaking of the bread. I told us that you did not make yourself. So you cannot truly know your worth, 
your purpose, your composition, your configuration. You are not made up of what the what anatomy of 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 the academia or the physiology of the medical professionals say that you're made of because they keep changing their minds. Whether we're hydrogen based or carbon based, we're now maybe we're carbon hydrogen based. Who knows? You know all of those things. They keep changing. You are not who anybody else says because nobody can know who you are as a child of God. Your true being is only known to the one who formed you for the purposes that he did. So how do I begin to know myself? The answer is there. No one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son. So how do I get to know myself? If the father knows me and I know the father, reading from left to right and right to left, all I have to do is be ready to stand long enough before the father to let him describe what he is looking at. Job stood before the father and the father says, this one is mine and he will not fail. Abraham stood before the father and the father says, this one is my friend. Jesus stood before the Father and Jesus said, and the Father says, this one is my son. Peter stood before Jesus and Jesus says, with that kind of revelation, you become the rock. Every single one of you that can receive insight from the Holy Spirit. And so the problem with many of us is we're not standing enough before the only one who knows us for him to describe us. When my wife and I go out and she needs to touch up on her makeup and there's no mirror around, guess what she does? She stands before me. And she tells me, what else do I need to adjust? But if she turns her back to me, I cannot help fix the situation. And that is the reason why the Bible did not say you standing before a picture. It says you're standing before a mirror. Because when you stand before a mirror, the image is both ways. So when I stand before the Father, he sees me and I see him. He describes me and I describe him. So if I want to hear the father describe what I truly look like, I describe what the father looks like. That is why I tell him, you are who you say you are. You are the lover of my soul. You are the healer of my flesh. You are the lifter of my countenance. You are the glory and the lifter of my head. And when I describe him, he describes me. He says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You are the head and not the tail. You are an apostle unto the nations. You are a bringer of joy everywhere you go. In fact, I tell you one, you are my righteousness in Christ Jesus. We need to describe one another because nobody else knows who we are. We are secrets, we are mysteries. No one knows the Father, nobody knows me. So how do we get to know each other? By telling each other what we see. If that is not incentive enough for you to stand before the Father, I don't know what else can inspire you and motivate you. Spend time with your heavenly father. Talk to him. Tell him what you know of him and he will tell you what he knows of you. And then, you know where it gets better is the fact that after the father has revealed to you who you are, he gives you the authority to go and tell other people. That's what Jesus says. He says, and then the son can reveal to whomever he wills. So I have the right to show off who I am in Christ Jesus. But I need to first of all show up. And know who I am before I can show off. Otherwise, I'd be lying to the world of who I am that I am not. Let us break bread. In fact, I believe we're ready for one more verse of scripture. And we're going to break bread. If not, that we've been here since 2 o'clock for the baby shower. I want to read four more scriptures. But I will be reasonable or maybe compassionate. So Genesis 11 verse 7. You see, this one. Did you get your one word from Genesis 11:27? Can I tell you the word that I got? The word that I got from Genesis eleven twenty seven. 27. Say that again. My, sorry, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Thank you, Sheila. At least I know someone was listening. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me let you get your own word. Let me not tell you my word. All righty. Genesis eleven seven. We're going to read this, and I promise you we're going to break bread. The Bible says, come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's Speech. <laughs> you know, 
one of the slogans for this season at Communion House is what? You need to learn to read from left to right and then right to left. Because the one who is at the right hand of the Father is coming for the ones who are left. I hope you got it. Left to right and then right to left. Those of us who are left, we are left to right everything that is wrong with the world. Okay, we are left, we are the remnants, so that we can write. And that is the reason why the president of the United States at the moment is called Joseph Biden. Because he's yet one of those signs that the Lord put up. Remember Donald Trump and Jared Kushner? How they are resigned to the church, announcing the arrival of the beast? Because that's what their name means when you combine it together. Donald, Trump, Jared Kushner. Donald means a mighty king. Trump means to announce. Jared means the arrival. Kushner means the beast. So a mighty king announces the arrival of the beast. So when both of them were standing together for no political reasons, no administrative reasons, they were just standing together for like three weeks, about 21 days on television. They were always just appearing. Do you remember that season? When they were both, they were just appearing together. No political or governmental justification. People questioned them in the news why they were always together for that period of time. It was because God wanted the church to see a sign. And another sign came in place of them simply because until Jesus comes, signs will continue to replace signs. Because the horsemen of the apocalypse, they are on the heels of one another. Those of you who heard me preach in 2019 of the message of the economist, the world in 2020, you would remember that I showed you the picture that the, the children of this world themselves are putting out there. It shows you that each one of the horsemen of the apocalypse stands in the shadow of the other. As one goes, the other begins. And that is how the signs of the end times are. And so when jo Donald Trump and Jared Kushner, they were standing as a sign raised by God for the sake of the elect. When they left, another sign came on the scene, and his name is Joseph Biden. The word Joseph literally means addition, or the Lord will add. But the significance of the person of Joseph was that he was the beloved of his father. Joseph was the beloved of the father, and Biden means to remain. That is Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Lord is letting us know that we will remain those of us who are left to right all of what is wrong with the world. We are not escaping anywhere. We will be caught up to meet with him in the blue skies to be changed in an instant and then to return to inherit the earth and to fulfill the agenda of our heavenly father. So rapture is not an escape, it's an equipping. And that is the reason why in the book of Jeremiah that we read two weeks ago, the Lord says, to Jeremiah, go and tell my people not to listen to the false prophets and the elders of the people who will tell them that soon you will be withdrawn from Babylon and taken back to your place. He says, tell them that's a lie because you shall remain in Babylon because you are my beloved. You are his Joseph and you will abide in. You will abide. You will remain. And let me tell you something, the power to remain is the power to become. When you become that light, darkness will not chase you. You will chase darkness. We will not run away from problems. Problems will run away from us. Malaria will hear that you are coming to town and take a leave of absence. Argument and chaos will hear that you are coming into the room and excuse itself. I remember when the Lord started to teach me these things, I went to consult for an organization that is very rooted in witchcraft. I'm sorry, in pharmacology. In, in the pharmaceuticals. Excuse my, my, my German there. And while I was there, the Lord told me, he said, shave every hair on your head. And you know me. I like to grow my hair, but when the Lord says it, it needs to go, it goes just like that. You see evidence, so many proofs of me growing my hair and cutting it. And so when the Lord came to me, he said, shave your hair before you go to that place. I had been in consecration for weeks before the Lord. This was in the year 2013, and he says, shave your head. And I know the meaning of it, because that wasn't the first time he was telling me. Whenever he tells me to shave my head like that, there are times wherein he would say that as an indication of a fresh oil that he wants to pour on my head. So he poured the oil, and I went to this place, 
multi-billion dollar organization. They had a problem. They were talking to everybody. Nobody could fix it. Somebody said, look, let's talk to this guy. He's very academic minded. Maybe he can put in some research. When they spoke to me on the phone, within 45 minutes, I described to them what the solution was. The word got out. They said, you're the man. And I needed that kind of opportunity because we were as broke as chalk. So I needed to work for one hour and get paid for seven. So I needed that kind of opportunity to be able to move from a rented house, an apartment, to move to a house. So no matter how backward you think you are and how left behind you think you are, as long as you are standing before the one who knows you and the one that you know, when your day comes, you will overtake the ones that have gone ahead of you. One project is what it takes. One opportunity and one door is all it takes. So I'm encouraging you, Brad. You know what I'm talking about, Brother Brad. You know, he's been telling you to wait on him. You will overtake the chariot of horses. Keep waiting on him. Let me tell you something. Some people are willing to offer you unsolicited advice. Unsolicited counsel. You don't have to go with what they say. Because you just need to stay and let the Lord move first and then you can follow him. You know exactly what I mean. So they can say whatever they want. Even the enemy might come and say to you, Oh, but daughter of Zion, do you not know that there is safety in the multitude of counsel? You should say to that voice when it comes that the Lord has laid in Zion for the foundation a stone. And it is a precious cornerstone. And you stand upon that stone and every other ground can be a sinking ground. Stand upon the counsel of the Lord and shame the wisdom of Satan. You see, when the Lord took me to that place and I walked in, I felt the thickness of the opposition. I knew that I had come to a place that is an altar. I knew there were altars to Satan in that place. For a whole month, I couldn't produce one report. Every time that I'm in there interviewing people, talking to people, the opposition was so much, I felt like I was going to lose my mind. And the final day that I was supposed to give my presentation, and I won't hold you much longer after this one, the very final day, I got up and I said to the Lord, it's very obvious that I am not going to deliver on this project. And he says to me, I'm glad that you have come to that realization. He says, because you will not, but I will. And when he said that to me, <laughs> the moment the Lord says that he will, we, we better just hands off everything. I closed my computer with all the empty pages. You know when you don't have anything to write, you start designing your background? I was changing the color of the slides. I had like a dozen slides with different colors. Background images, images of a giraffe, all kinds of things were there. And as soon as he said that, I shut down the computer and I went to get some breakfast. I was walking around like an aimless Joe, but the reality of it was that I am just an arrow. I don't aim myself. He aims me. And when the Lord aims you at the target, you can never miss. When I showed up at the meeting, the global legal counsel for the organization said he could not come into the room. <laughs> when I heard that he wasn't coming into the room, I was like, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so there was a holy pandemonium. Nobody wanted to come into the room. I went in there with a blank computer, no presentation. While they were trying to figure out the confusion, the chaos, and the darkness, the Lord was forming his light in the conference room. You see that 40 minutes or so of confusion outside. How would they come in to have a meeting with a consultant on the legal matter and the chief legal counsel, global legal counsel for the company said he wasn't coming. That was the time that it took for me to create what the Lord had created. I was simply downloading from heaven. As soon as I was done, there was even no time to review because am I going to now review what the Lord has done? The Bible says, who is it that instructs the Lord? Is there any amongst you who questions him? What did I tell you? To be God means to be unquestionable. There was even no time to review. They walked in and they said, we're finally ready. And that was the victory. The enemy left the gate before I got there. So I didn't have to throw punches at anybody. Everything I was presenting was a legal matter. If the legal counsel was there, there would have been an argument. It would have been like a law court. But the man said not a word. 
By the time I received my final check from the payment, I heard that they fired him after the meeting based on my recommendation. And I'm like, I made recommendations. I thought I was just there. You see what I'm saying? When you are light, you don't have to fight darkness. It will flee. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And he will give to you the very desires of his heart because that will become the desires of your heart. Open the bread and the wine and let us glorify God. Father, we thank you because of your fullness have we all received grace for grace. And the sufficiency of our lives does not consist in the abundance of the things that we own, but in your kind benevolence by your mercy that is renewed every morning. May we stand forever grateful and faithful. May we stand forever ready and equipped because we are only made ready by your love and the radiance of your face. Let us know our place and let us know who we are in you that we may soar upon our high places. Hear me, O gates of hell, that you may know. The Lord has arisen in Zion and his favor is moving me toward the possession of my possession. I am coming because Jesus is coming. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our time is fast spent. I want to apologize to Chris and Kayla because they have an amazing testimony that is ready to go. So, which means both of you have to be here on Tuesday in Jesus' name. Amen. And then they will share the testimony with us. I'm going to get stepped down from here. Alan, are you ready to come and close out the service and say a blessing over the offering? But one thing that I want to leave you all with is this. Can I read one more scripture? Come with me to Revelation chapter 22 verse 9. Hmm. Revelation chapter 22 verse 9. You see, um, I know that the Lord has already spoken to you today. I know you came in here and you're saying, God, I'm going to church today. I need a word. I need a word. If that was you, can I see your hand up when you were coming in here today? You specifically came in here. Your hand is not up, because, but I saw that you were coming here with a purpose. Yes. I know God has already spoken to you. Maybe that's why you're not raising your hand. But you see, in that Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 is the word that you need. What you came for that will keep your peace consistent. You're tired of feeling good about where you're at, right? Please remind me your name again. Hazel, you know, I know that you're tired of feeling good about where you're at sometimes and some other times you're worried. Some other times you, you feel alone. Some other times you feel you have support. It's been topsy-turvy. It's been up and down. I see you as the Lord has revealed you to me going up and down the mountain, the hill, the roller coaster of emotions. It's not your physical condition. It's not the hormones. It is the journey. And you're tired. And the Lord says to me that in that word, is your stability. You see, because that word that we have just read, that the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father, He wants to reveal Himself to you. Because the moment you know Him, that is called wisdom. The Bible says the fear of God, which is the consciousness of God, is the beginning of wisdom. And once you receive that wisdom, it shall be the stability of your times. You see, the one that is hanging by a thread is about to be even shaken further. But the Lord's wisdom will be the stability of your time. They may move and shake, but not you. And because you will remain, you will also receive that authorization by God to reveal who you are to them, that they also may be transformed. They need to see who you are to the child, who you are in the home, and they will become like you. You are the example that will produce after your own kind. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. we we'll save Revelations 22, 9 for another day. God bless you, Alan. Let's celebrate the Lord. Come on, somebody. God is good. Not going to hold us. The given details are on the screen. You'll see them there. If you need an offering envelope, my brother Kenyatta has the basket right before us. Let's give in faith with a cheerful heart and what the Lord has done. Several ways to give, cash up, dollar sign, communion house, PayPal at communion house, as well as the Zelle phone number and the website as well on the slide. We'll wait a few more seconds. 
as we get that in order, and we will close out. Hallelujah. Who is like unto thee, O God? There is none like you, O God. We give you praise for how, O God, you have shared with us plainly your plan, O God. You revealed to us yet again another side of you. Lord, as we behold you knowing more about ourselves of who you have called us to be. Lord, we thank you for what you have spoken through your oracle, O God. Granting unto us the spirit of understanding that we may run with what we have heard, O God. That we will be effective in implementing your will here in the earth. Lord God, let these times, these offerings, that you, by your hand, have allowed us to receive through work, O oh God, through divine placement, knowing that your word declares that you give seed unto the sower. Let these tithes and offerings be found pleasing in your sight as we bring them before you cheerfully. And Lord, we know that by your hand you indeed shall increase it and shall command the blessing upon our storehouses. We declare that all glory and honor and power and might belong to you. And we all say it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. Come on. Let's act like we know. Praise God. God is so good. Don't forget, this will premiere tomorrow evening on YouTube, so make sure you lock in to that. One thing I encourage us in as well is throughout your work week, you know, just have it plain. Let it get in your spirit as you can uh, uh, let these mysteries unfold as they're being revealed to us. We give God praise. Everyone, thank you so much for being a blessing to my wife and I. We just bless y'all so much, and thank y'all for coming to support us. I pray that everyone have a blessed night. We'll see y'all soon.